some of their convictions, <clears throat> and I don't, I can't, the coloring didn't come out correctly. <clears throat> but basically, one of the, we won't read all of these, but one of the convictions um, that they have is the second line, third line down, encourage variety, varieties of research aimed at improving human health and well-being while re registering caution about enhancements that might lead beyond what might be the baseline of human. A pretty generic statement that they would support this kind of thing if it helped an individual person. But, the next slide, um, they have real problems with um, states, the second line, likewise this church rejects goals and policies that will use any form of genetic knowledge or technology to create supposed states of near perfect perfection or near immortality. That's what the document says. So in this instance, they, they are basically supporting what this couple did because it's helped keeping the health of that child. At least that's how I read it. But if Karen wanted to go out and have a boy, that's probably the document wouldn't support that kind of thing. Let's go to the next slide. Just a couple of more things because we need to, we need to close. Um, they do have a, some things on, there are some specific recommendations. Most of it's pretty generic. And basically it says there are two sides to every issue and we need to look and have discussion and have these conversations and be humble in the face of what we're, what, we're, what we're talking about and respect each other's positions because there can be positions on either side of these complex things. But there are a couple of things they did talk about which I think are important and are com important to us now. The use of embryos. This church respect for the value, worth, and dignity of human embryonic life precludes the creation of embryos expressly for research purposes. So embryo farming is incompatible with this church's understanding of the value of life. And I think most of us could agree with that statement. But that's, it's certainly possible. We could, we could have embryo farms, and there may be embryo farms in other countries. On the other hand, this church cannot be indifferent to the sufferings of patients who await the therapeutic potential of regenerative medicine. It welcomes up scientific research and aims at finding alternative sources of pluripotent stem cells that do not involve the use of embryonic human life. And some of you may know that's a real intense area of research to take just our skin, for example, and turn them into stem cells, and that's possible. But they may not fully represent the kind of thing that doctors might want to use to do cell therapy. So in the meantime, <clears throat> this document states this, and this is, <clears throat> this is a directly opposed, <clears throat> excuse me, to what the Catholic Church would say, and in fact what the prior administration had in the, the use of embry embryonic stem cells. In the meantime, it accepts the use of surplus frozen embryos that were created for infertility treatment but are no longer needed since they are unlikely to be implanted and will ultimately be discarded. It seems preferable that they be used in research that may be beneficial to millions of humans and future generations. Any comments on that? Next one, <clears throat> so we can get through. Just, they also talk about human cloning because that's certainly on the horizon if they can clone a woolly mammoth, which probably will happen. It's possible to think about cloning us. This church rejects the technological imperative. That is, it rejects the prevalent practice or belief that we are free to use any knowledge that becomes available to create any technological application if the market, if the market will support it. Just, I think we are a market-driven culture. And you can just see how that woolly mammoth is going to be transferred across the world to be seen in various zoos. Likewise, the reproductive cloning of human individuals is rejected. Currently, attempts to clone a human being represent an unacceptable experimentation, basically violating the principle of respect. However, it does say, and it's being, I think, pretty honest here, the document does say it implies that it's going to happen. And some other culture may very well do this. And those individuals deserve respect and be treated as individual people and not as a clone. Because I think the document expects that this will probably happen somewhere else, probably not in the United States. Next slide. What next? So we'll end here. Um, a revised draft will be circulated. I encourage you to go on the website and read it if you want. Um, if you want to see it, it's real easy. I have one extra copy up here if one of you want to take one away today. But if you just Google e ELCA genetic statement, you'll get to it really quickly, within seconds. And you can download a PDF of it. We need to share and talk, and that's what we're doing today. 
Um, the ELCA did build a Bible study series on this. It's about 13 sessions. One wouldn't have to do that. But if you're interested, uh, Karen and I would be willing to talk to the pastors and maybe organize, I don't know, four or five Bible studies that go into some of these issues in more depth using the study guide that the ELCA prepared. It's quite good, actually. We need to have di dialogue with other cultures and faiths. Again, I think a lot of these things are going to happen outside of our control. <coughs> Not that control is it, because I think we, we have a collectively in the United States, I think we collectively share at least a, a modicum of a certain level of ethical responsibility. But that's not necessarily true for other cultures on the other face, and we need to be able to have that dialogue with them. Investments. Karen and I talked about this a lot. If you don't think that Monsanto should be policing their corn, you probably shouldn't be investing in Monsanto. And then think about the choices, costs, and consequences. Next slide. Uh, at Mayo, actually, it turns out there's a huge genetics community, and in there, a lot of them are members of Zumbo Lutheran Church. Okay. I don't think you probably are aware of that. Dan Van Dyke, Rhett, and I are all consultants in cytogenetics. Karen Wayne is a genetics counselor in the cytogenetics lab. Karen works in the molecular genetics lab. Jamie Randolph was a tech in the genetics lab, the clinical genetics lab, and is now uh, a the MS of theology student at Luther Seminary, and she's a member of Zumbro. Nearly every male clinic physician. I saw Susan Hankey over here a little bit ago. She actually is one of the operators of the next generation sequencing devices at Mayo. So we have a lot of expertise here. Next slide. And just to close, we heard on Colbert Report some wonderful things last week, and it's going to relate. Cornell West is a philosopher at Princeton, and he was being interviewed by Colbert. Justice is what love looks like in public, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. Colbert then said, Love is a steadfast commitment to the well-being of other people. I, he's, this, this TV show, there's a lot of four-letter words in it, but this, this Stephen Colbert is a devout Catholic, and he has been known to proclaim the Lord's Prayer, the Creed. He will proclaim the Gospel on this TV show. The professors at the seminary love him. One of the few outlets in this country where ethical principles are broadcast to the world. Okay. And that's basically a transliteration of Micah. He has showed you people what is good and what does the Lord require of you to walk, love justice and walk humbly with your God. And we'll solve the last slide as an advertisement for the Man and Mercy Retreat. We'll probably talk a little bit about this with Alan Story when he's here. And we really, maybe we have time for just a couple of questions. So I would start. Yeah. Uh, So Mike made the comment, those of us who work at Mayo have to do IRB human subjects training every year as part of our employment, especially if we were involved in research. So the, the ethical treatment of human, human subjects. And those of us who work with animals have to do the same thing, the animal training. And Mike was saying it sounded to him like the statement of the ELCA is very similar to the sort of things we team were taught as part of our IRB or Institutional Review Board training at Mayo. And that's true. In fact, a lot of the language is there in the ethical piece. What's overlaid on it is a lot of the biblical um, interpretation of where one can come up with those things without necessarily dealing with the various things that we deal with, the more secular documents we worry about when we do IRB training. How many of you would be interested in a Bible study like this for a short one, um, one month or so? Well, good. That looks like there might be enough to make it worthwhile. It would be fun. Thank you all for coming.